This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description. Welcome to Close Readings, a series of LRB podcasts about British and American poetry, drawing on the rich archive of essays and reviews and memoirs of poets that have appeared over the years in the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry. I teach English at the University of Oxford, and I'm talking with Mark Ford, poet, critic and professor of English at University College London. And our topic today is the American poet Robert Frost, who I suppose is as famous for being a New Englander as Hardy was for being a man of Wessex. And yet, Mark, he, he was not anything to do with New England as a, in terms of where he was born. No, he was born in San Francisco and he was named after the Confederate general Robert E. Lee. So the notion of Frost as this Yankee uh, is contradicted by his very name. He was born in San Francisco to a rather feckless father who had grand ambitions and had been to Harvard, but who worked in newspapers and also tried to get into politics, but rather failed, particularly at the latter. He lost all his elections and he was also an alcoholic. And his wife was Scottish, in fact, so not American at all. And it wasn't a marriage that was particularly of similar temperaments. She was very religious and he wasn't. And I think a lot of the disruptions and the voids and the uncertainties and the anxieties played out in Frost's poetry can be traced back to this rather rackety childhood, which sort of ended when his father died when he was only uh, 11 or 12. And the family moved from San Francisco to New England, where Frost Sr.'s um, parents lived. Uh, and after that, they had a very hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, his mother worked as a school teacher, and he worked in a variety of jobs in his teens. So they weren't at all uh, kind of settled or, or kind of a, a part of the gentry. And he's a very unsettled young man, isn't he? He, he goes to Dartmouth College, but gives up after a, a few weeks and enters Harvard, but only there for two years, marries his childhood sweetheart. But you get the sense, don't you, in those early years of someone who's sort of drifting and hasn't really f- found themselves or, or, or learned what they are. Certainly. And I think the attraction towards Eleanor White, whom he married uh, eventually, was kind of the search for some kind of anchorage or some sense of belonging, some connection. And um, it's a rather kind of striking anecdote or more than an anecdote. When she turned him down the first time when he wanted to marry her, he went off to a place called the Dismal Swamp. And in the Dismal Swamp, he, he was kind of very kind of morose and so on. He writes about this comically or talks about it comically. But so much of his poetry is sort of set in a, in a dismal swamp. And a swamp is something that has no bearings. You can't find out where you are, where you're supposed to be going, what you're allowed to do, what you can't do. And part of Frost's obsession with borders and boundaries and control is because of his awareness of this other side of things, chaos, uh, formlessness. Uh, and a complete sense of drift. And I think though that the polarity of being completely at sea or in a dismal swamp uh, in comparison with this search for form, and he famously, famously described form was crucial to him, and he said writing uh, without form was like playing tennis with the net down. And I think that can be seen as a formal choice, but I think you can also relate it back to his psychic makeup, which really needed things to connect to. Otherwise, he would feel completely disconnected. And I think that disconnection is is what sort of, in some ways, makes him a a 20th century poet, even when his idiom, as in his first volume, um, uh, A Boy's Will, looks rather 19th century. Yes. And there's a a lot of domestic tragedy, isn't there? Two children die. Helen Vendler and her piece in the the review talks about it as a long and harrowing life. And that's certainly the case, isn't it, when you go back to the biography. There's an awful lot of unhappiness there. And I suppose you can see quite a lot of the poetry, as as, as you've just been saying, as as an attempt to cope and somehow understand that sort of pervasive un- unhappiness. I think the fear of madness is lurking there as well. His, his sister uh, ended up in a insane asylum, as did his second daughter, Irma, ended up in an insane asylum. His eldest son, Carol, committed suicide. His youngest daughter died uh, shortly after giving birth. Um, in the 30s in particular, it reads like a, just a, an unending series of disasters culminating uh, in Carol's suicide, but his wife, Eleanor, died in the uh, in 1936. So that's to look a long way ahead. But I think 
that sense in which Frost's poetry is holding back some anxiety or fear of complete catastrophe is what is is the undercharge of poems which look on the surface of quite simple and which appealed to an audience, a massive audience eventually in America, as rather kind of stirring and uplifting poems. Yes, sort of wholesome and full of New England fresh air, as it were. But underneath, as, as I suppose Randall Jarrell was the first person to fully explore lurking all these darker currents that I, I guess we'll touch on as we as you move through the career. So the big shift in his life, I guess, is 1912 in September when he upsticks and brings the family to live in England. Tell us a little bit about that. What's the context for that sort of decision? The important thing to say is he's 38 by this time. A lot of poets' careers are long over by the time they're 38. We tend to early. So he lived this this rather kind of an existence. He tried school teaching. He worked in a leather shop. He worked in a shoe shop. He worked in a factory. He got sacked actually from that job because he didn't show up on time and all sorts of things. But he he was interested in education from quite a young age and he worked as a school teacher. His mother was a, also a school teacher, a famously bad one. Parents often complained because she couldn't keep the class in control. Frost was better at that. but he, And he developed into a very um, uh, individual and in some ways rather erratic educationalist. Uh, He liked to run down teachers and often, but it was in teaching that he kind of established himself in his 20s and early 30s. But he also worked as a poultry farmer. He always claimed not to have been a very good farmer. And he wrote a number of stories actually for for various poultry (laughs) newspapers, which um, have been uh, exhumed. He was always ambitious and he always knew or always felt that he had the goods to be a great poet, but he was biding his time. But he really did bide his time. I can't think of, well, I suppose Whitman was in his mid-30s before he started writing Song of Myself. But really, Frost was a very late starter. And all the modernist poets with whom he's now kind of often grouped, though much younger, had got going by then and published books. Uh, So he comes over when he's 38 in 1912, because London was the centre of culture at this time. We tend to think of America as being 20th century America being full of these great poets and this great poetic culture. But I always keep in mind Gertrude Stein's comment when asked what it was like back there in America. And she replied, there's no there there. Uh, And something of that, I think, permeates Frost's figurations of America. It's a kind of blank canvas. Uh, He conveniently forgets the people who lived there before the Europeans colonized it. But it's a blank canvas in which you have to improvise your existence. And in this, he's following in the lines of transcendentalists like Emerson. And these are poems he actually wrote. Some some of the poems in in, um, A Boy's Will and North of Boston, he was working on, many of them he was working on, on the farm in Derry. But he realized that nothing was going to happen if he stayed working on the farm in Derry and sent them out to provincial American papers, where about five or six had been published. So he arrives in in London, uh, 1912, with a boy's will and much of north of Boston, kind of, you know, in the safe box, the locked box, as he used to call it, where he kept his drafts. And he met a lot of crucial, important figures in London. So he's got 20 years of poems, really, in his pocket as when he arrives in England. And he's first published as a poet by a British publisher, isn't he? He's, so he, he appears on the scene, as it were, in the, in the midst of Georgian poetry. And he met lots of them. He met Lassell's Abercrombie and Edward Thomas and uh, Wilfred Gibson uh, and established good relationships with them. And in some ways, would you, would you say that, that his, his style, his voice as a poet, also grows out of some of the things that the Georgian poets were uh, influenced by, such as preeminently Hardy and, and Wordsworth and, and that sort of tradition? I think undoubtedly he... he and also Tennyson, um, whom he often taught when he was... Um, uh, uh, a university teacher and a school teacher. And so unlike the other poets we associate with American modernism, he wasn't looking for this decisive break with the idiom of 19th century poetry. He came to England, he thought of it as the land of Paul Graves' golden treasury. Well, that's not how Eliot conceived it. Though actually, if you go through the wasteland, it's amazing how many of those quotes are in Paul Graves' golden treasury. He definitely read that when he was uh, in St. Louis. Anyway, Frost is is divided in some ways between the the modernist vision of the world, which is a, a, in some ways a rather sort of dispiriting or depressing one as you get in the wasteland, and the Georgian idiom, 
which is much more connected to the Paul Graves Golden Treasury and the traditions of English verse. So uh, in a way, it strikes me that Eliot leaves America to come to Europe and Frost leaves America to come to England. So they're, they're, they're arriving in sort of slightly different destinations, aren't they, in, within their own trajectory? Anyway, so A Boy's Will, as you said a moment ago, is the first book of poems. Uh, it's a book of poems that he casts in a way that makes it feel quite autobiographical, doesn't he? And, and the very first poem in it, I think I'm right in saying, is a poem called Into My Own, which establishes all sorts of themes that are going to recur th- throughout his long writing life. What do you make of Into My Own? Well, yes, I mean, he was self-consciously aware of the traditions of the rugged individualism, which had uh, emerged in the 19th century as the, the dominant way of kind of expressing the ideal of the American hero, someone who was disconnected and was somehow self-reliant, to use Emerson's term. And Into My Own very obviously fits into that particular uh, myth. But it's also disturbing in terms of, well, I'll I'll, I'll read it so that uh, our listeners get a sense of what's going on in it. Into My Own. One of my wishes is that those dark trees, so old and firm they scarcely show the breeze, were not as twere the merest mask of gloom, but stretched away unto the edge of doom. I should not be withheld, but that some day into their vastness I should steal away, fearless of ever finding open land or highway where the slow wheel pours the sand. I do not see why I should e'er turn back, or those should not set forth upon my track to overtake me, who should miss me here, and long to know if still I held them dear. They would not find me changed from him they knew, only more sure of all I thought was true. So that strikes many of the characteristic Frost notes, doesn't it, that we'll touch on in in the course of our conversation, I'm sure. The allure of dark trees and that whole sense of undiscovered territory, that uh, that idea of America that you were referring to earlier on, which tempts you out. The whole darkness of the poem is also wholly Frostian, isn't it? Yes, the archetypal journey into the wilderness, which creates your sense of selfhood or re-establishes your sense of selfhood. It wouldn't find him changed, but more sure of everything he knew. So his selfhood already exists in some kind of uh, some form, but the the voyage into the wilderness will, and this, this is such a kind of corny uh, or, or such a standard American trope that it, it's interesting to find the spin that he gives it. And I think the spin comes in that sense of the sublime or some sense of wanting these trees to stretch away and to the edge of doom, that there is some kind of disaster lurking in these woods, that these woods aren't the wholesome woods or, or wilderness that you find in, I don't know, Huckleberry Finn, for instance, uh, or in James Fenimore Cooper's uh, novels. Uh, those, are, those are full of lurking dangers. But the, this is a kind of apocalyptic uh, uh, wilderness in which there are no landmarks. But his to test his selfhood or to create his selfhood or to establish and perform his selfhood, and I think I think the element of performance is absolutely crucial to Frost's whole persona uh, and his and of his personality that he performs himself, and that this is a ritual whereby he performs himself to, so as to make that that selfhood establish it in the minds of those who care for him and who then appreciate uh, the performance of selfhood which the poem has dramatised. I suppose the, the note of sureness on which that early poem ends isn't fully characteristic of some of the greater frost that's to come is it which is much more interested in perhapses and uncertainties and intimations and intuitions rather than the sureness of knowledge that you know is true I think he needed them both. Uh, the, Randall Jarrell has a great phrase uh, uh, that captures this. He talks of Frost's cast iron whimsy. So the idea that on the one hand, there's this kind of really steely sense of selfhood. On the other, there's this provisionality, which is absolutely, as you say, I, I would totally agree, absolutely central to the way, not only that his poems work, but the way he his theories about poetry were all about the, the block of ice that rides the flame and sort of melts in the process of becoming, that you don't know where it's going. It's all provisional. Uh, that, of course, itself is is a standard American trope. This sense of, of of making yourself up as you go along, uh, that that your selfhood is fluid. But in Frost, the two 
so polarities are fused or, or meet or interact with each other like two two chemicals and that's what is going on in a frost poem on the one hand the kind of ambition the conviction and the sense of election or sense of his own selfhood being very kind of strong on the other this kind of casting himself onto the kind of you know up the birch <laughs> he climbs the birch and swings it and who knows where it's going to take him and so on so this casting yourself uh, on, uh, to the winds uh, and they're both kind of standard sort of uh, uh, American myths, but Frost's kind of version of them is in line with, with with much kind of American mythology. But the point about it for Frost is it meant <laughs> a lot to him that he felt it, that this was his way of surviving empirically, not not just, you know, not just performing himself as a poet. He needed to perform himself as a poet to survive in the face of disaster, the dismal swamp, the chaos, the endless spaces. And I think one of the pieces... The Leo Marx piece in the LRB talks about Frost's vision of the world as in some ways bleaker and more relentless than that of Stevens, Eliot, or William Carlos Williams, that in comparison with the other modernists, his actual vision of the world was closer to that of, say, Samuel Beckett than it is to to Eliot, Stevens, or Williams, who all find kind of comforts in various kind of systems or structures, that Frost is on his own <laughs> as this poem. He's into his own. Uh, and that sense of the naked self, which really uh, was one which he experienced um, as well as kind of performing. Yes. So um, within this, as you say, and as, as Leo Marx says in his excellent essay, within this sort of general, rather gloomy kind of, uh, Marx even says moral nihilism characterises the Frost universe. Mm -hmm. um, within this, there is an Im important element, isn't there, which is the kind of tenacity that comes from labour, that comes from work. There's a great, you know, Frost Frostian mm -hmm. investment in the idea of just doing things. And I guess from that first volume of, of poems, a boy's will, perhaps the tuft of flowers c captures that ethic of, of the virtue of labour. And, and from the next uh, volume, perhaps his best known book, North of Boston, which was published again in England in 1914, the poem Mending Wall, I guess it also touched, wouldn't it, on, on that theme of, of, of the virtue of, of labour as, as something to occupy you in this otherwise rather dark and, and troubling moral universe. And labour is in some ways analogous to poetry for Frost in that sense. Uh, Mowing is probably his most famous early poem, and that concludes with those kind of ringing lines. The fact is the sweetest dream that labour knows. My long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. Uh, and he's often called the great poet of labour. And I think it's interesting to trace the influence of, of this, the way that Frost creates a poetry out of labour in a region, a particular region, it's, see its influence on Seamus Heaney uh, and other Irish poets, such as Paul Muldoon, whose father was also, was a farmer, um, a mushroom farmer. And the the importance of Frost to those uh, Northern Irish poets, that's actually how I first sort of came at Frost, through Heaney, Muldoon. Also, Derek Walcott wrote a great essay about him. So they're poets in some ways who figure themselves on the margins in relation to the centres of cultural production and who celebrate certain kinds of industry rural industry, but make it into a kind of existential experience rather than just sort of hymning strong, uh, good mowers. So every Frost poem, in, in some ways, it seems to me, is also about poetry, that his Ars Poetica is kind of bound into his whole way of describing labour. And he often makes that quite explicit, as in mowing or in um, The Tuft of Flowers. Say something about the significance of walls, because uh, you mentioned uh, the Irish poets who were all moved by Frost and, and in some senses em em emulate his his manner, which is at once pastoral but also political. And the uh, the metaphor of, of a wall, of something that divides um, people in a way which may or may not allow them to cohabit um, successfully or contentedly, uh, that's something that Frost is quite drawn to, isn't he? And, and Mending Wall has that repeated uh, tagline, which American libertarians are always very keen to to repeat about good fences making good neighbours. But I mean, the poem as a whole, it seems to me, isn't exactly as uh, upbeat about the virtues of rugged individualism as, as maybe it's uh, more um, optimistic readers like to think. No, I, I think all Frost poems, all Frost good poems, take these kind of stereotypes and that they explore them and they inhabit them in a way in which you are pulled in two directions. So there is a kind of enigma 
uh, an enigmatic aspect to almost all his great poems, which means you can be pull them in one way or pull them in another, and that no reading is final. Uh, and yet they need something final, like a wall, to enact their uncertainty or to explore their, their own sense of uncertainty. And they need characters as well. I think Frost is one of the great introducers of character into 20th century poetry. The neighbour with whom he mends wall um, is brilliantly hit off as um, someone coming from a kind of dark age. Uh, I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only and the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbours. I mean, it's, it's fabulously effective, partly because of this, on one level, we've got this kind of wry, ironic, intelligent, sophisticated person who's a farmer or playing at being a farmer against the genuine farmer, and he's teasing out the sort of implications of good fences make good neighbours, and yet also somehow endorsing it or allowing us to think that we would like to endorse it, but also making us aware of all that's involved in endorsing it, all that that leaves out, all the ways in which that is kind of complex or unsettling. And Frost, in the height of his popularity, was the Cold War in the post-war era, and good fences make good neighbours. <laughs> that was precisely what Frost often said, you know, uh, a strong, strong America depends upon its ability or its to go to war. And uh, in that sense, he, he chimed, particularly in the post-war era, very much with the Cold War mentality. Yes, but as, you, as you've just been saying, it's good that this aphorism, as it were, comes to the, the surface of this poem and is placed in the, in the voice of someone who's obviously a bit thick. <laughs> yes. So he's sending, you know, he's sending up his own kind of tendency to a certain kind of American folk wisdom, isn't he? Well, what, what he loves for it is mischief. You know, he talks about his, his poems as being mischievous. He writes poems uh, with lots of doors in them, but the doors are all shut. <laughs> or he talks about how what he wants his poems to do is to be like walking through a dark dark room with lots of objects placed down there so that you fall forwards in the dark, forwards and in the dark. He reiterates that in an interview. So this idea of being a, a mischievous poet. But he had a, a notion of play, which I think is again carried over particularly in the work of Paul Muldoon, a notion of play as being of the utmost seriousness and that seriousness and play can't really be dissolved from each other. But the play, the freedom you get from play is what gives you the imaginative expansiveness to be able to see around issues or to dramatise them and to engage with them. Again, it's a very empirical experience that Frost asks. He, he was a good theorist of poetry, but his poetry works through through it. The reason it, it appealed, sold out, uh, you know, 50,000 copies would sell out in a matter of weeks and so on. The reason why he would fill auditoriums with 3,000, 4,000 people, the kind of people, uh, kind of audiences that the pop stars would get was because it connected with some fundamental yearning in the, in the American public for some kind of reassurance, which he both gave them and didn't give them. I must quote here one of my favourite quotes fr from one of the pieces in the in the LRB. And I should say the four really outstanding pieces by Matt Bevis, Helen Vendler, uh, Leo Marx, and Peter Howarth. This terrific piece on, on the notebooks. One of them quotes Frost saying to Robert Lowell, "Hell is a half filled auditorium," and you can see footage of of his of his readings, and they are. You know, is as if the Rolling Stones are playing. Well, not quite, but still. It's a still. sentiment to which every professor's heart returns an echo, I'm sure. <laughs> it's very interesting what you're saying about the, his elusiveness, that, that he's at a, once an extraordinarily successful public figure and seems to represent something very solid and substantial that, that popular America can respond to and can I, perhaps even identify with. But at the same time, all his remarks about poetry, as you say, have an almost sort of Borgesian kind of playful, sort of self-cancelling, identity-joking sort of quality to them. And he's fond of saying things like, the more I say I, the more I always mean someone else. So th there is a kind of paradox, isn't there, about this sort of rugged, white-haired, New England kind of integrity, and at the same time, an absolute kind of slippery evasiveness of, of manner, which is actually the real subject of most of his great poems. Yes, and he inhabits these voices. It, North of Boston is my favourite, I think, of his books. It was the breakthrough volume. Um, and he wrote a lot of it in England, in fact. I mean, Home Burial, which I think is probably his greatest poem, and also inspired one of the very finest pieces of criticism ever, Randall 
Jarrell's long kind of analysis of it. A lot of it was written in Beaconsfield um, in, um, in, in Buckinghamshire or in Dimmock in Gloucestershire. So his two and a half years in England were not only useful for him, his promotion of his career, but he, he got into his groove in his most kind of satisfactory way. Uh, and the poems in North of Boston, which make use of characters in home burial, characters very, very close to his own. It, it's his, his own uh, first son, Elliot, died at the age of three of cholera and home burial, which is, I think, a genuinely kind of terrifying poem, as well as a brilliant analysis of a marriage between two people who just uh, are failing to understand each other, is, is, a, is a genuinely kind of unsettling poem. And home, it's got homes, uh, which he also talks about in Death of the Hired Man, which gives you two wonderfully contradictory sort of aphorisms about home. Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. That's the one. The other is, I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. And both kind of resolutely kind of negative <laughs> versions of home. It's a place where they, they have to take you in, where you don't have to deserve it, even if you behave very badly. It, it, and he's a great poet of interiors, of internal kind of you know, marital conflict. Yes, we should say something about uh, the dramatic situation in home burial, shouldn't we? It's a, a married couple talking about, as it were, the destruction of, of their home of, or the idea of their home because of uh, the death of a child who, as was the practice at the time, or was commonly the practice at the time anyway, was buried by by the father in the in the land around the house. And what the what the woman can't forgive him for is the way in which he's used the the labour of digging the child's grave as a kind of therapeutic measure for dealing with his grief. And she interprets his labouring and the, and the solace that he finds in labouring as a kind of heartlessness. So it's getting to things absolutely at the heart of Frost, isn't it, about the virtues of labour and work and whether or not those can be emotionally evasive as well as emotionally helpful for the person who is um, enjoying them. And the particularity of the poem is, is what is so kind of heartbreaking. When, um, I think it's the phrase which he says when he comes in, having dug the grave for the for um, the three-year-old and he's buried it with his own ancestors in the ancestral kind of grave. And she describes very brilliantly his digging. She, she has watched him from the very window there, making the gravel leap and leap in air, leap up like that, like that, and land so lightly. Like much of Frost, he uses monosyllables absolutely all the time and roll back down the mound beside the hole. I thought, who is that man? I didn't know you. And I crept down the stairs. And what's worse is when he comes in, having dug his eldest son's uh, grave, he says, three foggy mornings and one rainy day will rot the best birch fence a man can build. <laughs> it's a, like, the, like a, good fences make good neighbours. It's a New England aphorism, which he is saying in a fit of absent-mindedness. We could call it cast iron whimsy. <laughs> and this absolutely drives her round the bend. But at the same time, it's a brilliant Frost moment, isn't it? Because it's a poem all about how things can rot, you know, how things can be completely destroyed and undermined from within by... Uh, you know, by the events that can happen in a life. Um, it's a wonderful poem. And the Jarrell essay is, is, you're right, it's an absolute masterpiece. And uh, he focuses on the doors quite a lot. There's lots of doors in, in Frost as well, that uh, at the end of it, uh, she was opening the door, she's going to flee, opening the door wider. Where do you mean to go? First tell me that, he says. You know, this is a really brilliant characteristic of male domination, rage, however you want to characterise that particular phenomenon. I'll follow and bring you back by force. I will. Uh, I thumped the table there because it's in italics. I will. And what is meant in that I will? Uh, a Boy's Will was his first book. This idea of the will was central to Frost and the will involving itself in alien entanglements, as he put it in an essay. But how far can the will go? He needed these frontiers because the will had to could only discover itself by coming up against these front frontiers or discover it through its attempt to find some kind of consolation in the abyss of misery, which is, I think, so brilliantly captured in this poem, because it's a misery that's not shared. They're both miserable, but they're miserable in their different ways, and there's no bridging the gap between them, which is why she goes out the door at the end. He's very good, isn't he, about 
the loneliness that can uh, exist within relationships, not just the relationship of marriage, but also the relationship of neighbours or the relationship of uh, fellow citizens of a, of a, t- of a town or, or whatever it might be. And I think what's so interesting about his treatment of it is that he, he, he laments it in some sense. I mean, the loneliness of the married couple in this poem is devastating. But another part of him actually rather embraces loneliness, doesn't it? And loneliness is, is, the, is the precondition, really, for being Robert Frost. Yes, I, I would totally agree with that. And that, I think, goes to the idea of the performance, that the connections he makes are performative ones, which somehow don't last. Uh, everything is provisional in Frost. And a, a lot of the connections are actually ones which are almost speculative, like in A Tuft of Flowers, the flowers have been spared by a previous workman, or in The Woodpile, which is the last poem in North of Boston, he finds a woodpile and he thinks, well, who made this woodpile in the middle of this dismal swamp? And he feels a sort of transitory connection with this person uh, who has also engaged in labour, which he can then respond to. But it's provisional and it exists in the moment. And what he thinks is how different he was from the person who made the woodpile. And he feels a momentary connection with, with the person who left the flowers in a slightly more sentimental vein. But often the that the actual connections established are very provisional and temporary and are moved on from quite fast. Yes, and, and uh, The Woodpile, another lovely poem about wandering out into terra incognita, as it were, isn't it? There, there, so many of these poems are about wandering into different sorts of wilderness, either literal or figurative wilderness, and, and discovering traces of human lives with which you have a kind of connection, but also a disconnection. Well, that's the great point Leo Marx makes, isn't it, in, in his piece about them as kind of failed um, romantic encounter poems or kind of parodies of the romantic encounter poem uh, that rather than some kind of um, uh, uh, um, sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused uh, like you get in Wordsworth you just get a sense of blankness momentary recognition which is then swallowed up by the void and the opening of the woodpile is your archetypal frost landscape out walking in the frozen swamp one grey day (laughs) It's almost parodying his own characteristic landscape. I paused and said, I will turn back from here. No, I will go on further and we shall see. The hard snow held me, save where now and then one foot went through. I it didn't hold him. <laughs> it partially held him. The view was all in line straight up and down of tall, slim trees. Uh, there's no way you can tell them from each other. Too much alike to mark or name a place by. So as to say for certain I was here or somewhere else. I was just far from home that word again, home. And this is where he's so different from Thomas, isn't it? That Thomas's landscapes are always storied. There's a history to them. A poem like kind of 50 Faggots or something, which you could has a, a whole history of how those faggots got there, um, the, the, wood, the woods and the history of the field and so on. That sense of the, the history of England. And Frost is the opposite. He, he takes away the history because there was a history to America, but he deliberately erases it to create this kind of tabula rasa this blank canvas in which one must kind of quest for almost like a sort of someone in space for some kind of sign of life or meaning. So you mentioned Thomas there, and and what we're talking about, who the person we're talking about is Edward Thomas, who of of course is known to us as a war poet killed in the Great War. Although I don't think Thomas thought of himself as a war poet remotely. And this is perhaps the most significant friendship in Frost's life, would you say? Yes, uh, uh, undoubtedly. And he liked to characterise it as that. And they were equals to the extent that Frost's, after Thomas, Frost had what he used to call his boys, his disciples, and they all looked up to Frost and he would kind of educate them and so on. Louis Untermeyer uh, and Sidney Cox and so on. But Thomas, I mean, and Thomas often called Frost his only begetter, that, you know, uh, that Thomas... Frost said, you can turn this prose into poetry and you'll be a good poet. And Thomas said, hmm, that's not a bad idea. And wrote in you know, two and a half years what has, is one of the most enduring and valuable sort of bodies of work of the 20th century. But that was Frost's kind of encouragement was central to Thomas making that break. And, and it was the conversational tone which Frost had pioneered. And he really had pioneered it. There was no one else who had captured what he called the sound of sense in poetry. It's a slightly vexed term, but he he talks a great deal about it in letters and in essays, this idea that 
the poem must be in some kind of relationship to the speaking voice, which you couldn't say is quite the case in Tennyson, though you could say it is the case in Browning, <laughs> uh, undoubtedly. But he takes it one step further in terms of the banality of the conversations which many Frost characters get involved in. You know, he died in Fredericksburg or Vicksburg. I can't remember which it was. It should make a difference. Does it make a difference? And so on. It, you can almost parody, and he sometimes himself does parody his own kind of garrulousness. And the garrulousness is a way, I suppose, for establishing his authenticity as, to use the Wordsworth phrase, a real man talking to real men. Uh, and Thomas ran with this, and a lot of his great poems similarly have, have a kind of make use of conversation and fit it into a blank verse, which is just recognisable as blank verse, but is always, always undoing one's expectations in relation to the iambic pentameter. And that was the springboard for North of Boston and those great poems like A Servant to Servants, Death the Hired Man, and so on. And I think those are the most original of his poems in, in my book. So 1915, he returns to America. He's beginning to be quite successful now, isn't he? By 1916, 1917, his first two books of poems are republished in America. In 1916, he brings out a book called A Mountain Interval. And one of the poems in that, I suppose, is one of his most famous poems. And we've just been talking about Edward Thomas, um, a poem called The Road Not Taken, which is partly inspired, is, is it not, by his observing Edward Thomas's inability to decide which path to take whenever he went on a walk. <laughs> well, whenever he tried to do anything, Thomas could never make up his mind. And, and that's his melancholy was about not being able to make up your mind. And Frost, I think, was, was trying to point out that you can decisively not make up your mind in a poem. And this is a poem about decisively not making up your mind. But it's also a poem that guides the sort of standard American myth mythology of, I did it my way. So on the one hand, it, it's taken as a celebration of self-reliance and the, the notion that the way you did it was the hard way, but that's what made you who you are. But this poem rather parodies that. But as in Mending Wall, it also makes use of it. So it, it, it sort of needs that particular kind of crass myth to expand its own kind of ambiguities and uncertainties. And as Frost is always attempting to do, to have it both ways. Yes, uh, to, um, to, to lead a life which is uh, sh shadowed by the life that you haven't led. And the poem at once seems to think that that's a good attitude to have, but also to think that it's a very bad attitude to have. It's, it's one of those fantastic Frost poems that exemplifies what Peter Howarth says in his piece in the LRB about the way that, that great Frost poems are made out of undecidable conflicts uh, about two good things that are clashing with each other, even though on, on the surface, at least, the poems often look as if they are very even and steady and, and even perhaps a bit kind of banal or, or you know, homespun. You can you can find the sort of mischief, can't you, when he keeps talking about the two roads and how similar they looked. It's not as if they're any different. As for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. And then in the last stanza, he kind of shows how this kind of random choice is then transformed by the poet into some kind of act of Emersonian self-reliance in a rather sort of devious and deceptive and, and in, in a manner which, which is a kind of lie, really. Um, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in the wood and I, I took the one less travelled by and that has made all the difference. So he's kind of parodying that sense in which you kind of, you know, make out that you did it the hard way and that's what made you you the kind of hero that you are. So that's the mischief in Frost's poem, and that's the play. And the, the brilliance is the way you can get it both ways, and the way this was consumed by the American public. And he writes a letter in which he talks about how, you know, poems butter no parsnips, that he needs to make money from his poetry. And he distanced himself from Ezra Pound quite dramatically, because um, Pound reviewed his first book, and he said, you know, I hope you don't mind me liking these poems, he said to, to Frost, and, uh, and then reviewed the book twice once in America and, and once in Britain, but he didn't want to be caviar to the general, that Frost wanted, knew that he wanted to be a professional poet. And he was, in many ways, the first 20th century professional poet who managed to make a living through his connection with universities, uh, as well as selling books. Um, Allen Ginsberg, I think, called him the great entrepreneur of poetry. 
which uh, and he had a similar notion that everything had to come to market if it didn't go to market it wasn't worth anything nothing could be a kind of succès d'estime that didn't mean anything to him it had to be bought and that guaranteed that it was valuable even if those who bought it <laughs> didn't know what they were buying or understand it when they had bought it. Yes. Uh, Alden says in an essay in the 1930s that what distinguishes Frost is that he's not only a poet, but he's also a farmer. But of course, by that stage, Frost hadn't been a farmer for years. And as you say, he, in a way, is a very modern figure because he's a poet who makes his living not only by selling his books or poems, but also by being a professor. I mean, he teaches at Amherst for many years. He's the centrepiece of a very famous English school called the Breadloaf School of English, which was run out of Dartmouth College in, in Vermont. Um, and he, I mean, in a rather unexpected way for someone who casts himself in so many of his poems as being a, a sort of a, a homely and earthbound poet, he's actually an extraordinarily professional campus poet. Well, also as an outsider, he's always figuring himself as an outsider, as somebody outside the establishment. I and mean, of course, the American hero has to be outside the establishment, but he is the most canny. Uh, and it's hilarious if you read his biography, all these universities vying, giving him more and more money, the University of Michigan, Florida, uh, Amherst, all offering more and more money. And this was a guy sort of 10 years ago who was sort of, you know, could, couldn't make a living from his chickens uh, and was, was kind of being paid as a teacher. Um, so the, the, the gamble has paid off and the, the astronomical sums which he starts being paid, both for his readings and for his kind of professorships, but he was there, you know, one day every fortnight often in these places, <laughs> or one day a month he'd give a reading and talk to some bright students. Uh, he, he did it his way. <laughs> he really did do it his way uh, on that sense. But it brokered the whole industry of the poet in residence, you know, no kind of Lowell or Berryman or or. So as his um, success grows, he continues to publish. He publishes selected poems and collected poems. A new volume called New Hampshire comes out in 1923. And that's the volume in which perhaps his most famous poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, appears. Do you think this poem deserves its celebrity or uh, do you think it's been rather over, over celebrated? No, it's a, it's a, ter it's a terrific poem and it, and it works. And, and um, everyone in America knew it. There, there's a, there's an amusing clip of uh, Frost in a, giving a, re a reading and um, he says, I'm going to read Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. I read it the other day, he said to 3,000 people. And uh, I asked if anyone had not, did not know the poem. One boy intrepidly put up his hand. So he's at the same time sort of celebrating his own fame, but also his own sense of himself as an institution. This poem plays quite a large part in him becoming an institution, doesn't it, I suppose, because it's so famous and, and seems to capture so much of what Frost means for his very increasingly wide readership. What do you think is it about the poem that makes it a kind of a typical or an exemplary Frostian poem? Well, it's a pause in the routine. As many of his poems are a, a kind of moment when he pauses doing something and sort of has some kind of existential recognition of something sort of beyond the ordinary. But it sticks, it conveys that sense of the extraordinary through a very kind of ordinary language. And he almost seems to be gesturing towards the Frostian when he says, whose woods these are, I think I know. And I think you know too, they're Frostian woods. Uh, we're, we're, we're approaching Frostian woods to have a Frostian experience. Uh, and we're going to be on our own. We're going to be in the middle of the snow and we're going to hear something almost otherworldly, but not quite otherworldly. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake, that nature's snow and wind take on a kind of seductive, lulling rhythm, which is part of this slow approach almost to, uh, it, it can be seen as a proto-suicidal poem. And, and that's how um, a character in The Sopranos, um, it features it in one of those episodes, is set it for homework. And he says, yeah, it's about death, isn't it? The woods are lovely, dark and deep. It's about the lure of suicide. So like Into My Own, it's a kind of invitation to uh, slide into some kind of chaos uh, but it, it enacts the resistance to that chaos rather than the sort of triumphant return from that chaos, as Into My Own does, in that he reminds himself of the promises that he has to keep and the uh, miles to go before he sleeps, all his obligations. One of the things that strikes me as being very characteristic about that, that poem is, is the way that Frost sets it in evening. And uh, an awful lot of his poems are, are set in eventide or, or nighttime, aren't they? Yes, um, there's an old man's winter night, which he thought is 
sort of best poem, which is a terrifically kind of bleak and remorseless poem about how an old man spends his night uh, afraid of things, clomping around. And there's ones like Desert Places or Acquainted with the Night. And the nighttime often, uh, or his very early poem, Storm Fear, nighttime often incarnates the sense of chaos and impending disaster, which is what the Frost poem is attempting to hold off. He described poems as a momentary stay against confusion, so that these poems, which are like the woodpile, kind of, you know, formed and ordered and somehow bulwarks against this endless night. I think that is a very new world experience as well, or, or the way in which Frost configured the new world, that it was itself kind of morally neutral uh, and completely uh, without any kind of guidelines so that one had to invent one's own reality there. And the poems are somehow a way of blanking out or a momentary stay against um, this threat of disaster. You probably know Randall Jarrell very amusingly changed the V in Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening to a capital V. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though, uh, the idea of it being Greenwich Village. And this was a kind of joke against Frost's use of the rural, that in fact Frost knew what he was doing and that he was a kind of cosmopolitan who was pretending to be <laughs> a villager, so to speak. It's a joke that works in showing up how Frost's idiom can be taken at face value, but also can be taken as the artful construct construct that it obviously was. Yes, a great deal of artfulness, but then, as you've been saying, underneath it, a, a great kind of abysm of something very dark. And I, I was very taken uh, reading around in preparation for our chat today by something Lionel Trilling said about his little poem called Design, where Trilling said to his readers, why don't you read this poem and see if you sleep the better for it? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the idea that, you know, that the night times of, of readers are going to be troubled as much as the night times of, of Frost's own characters are, are troubled. Well, he had this notion that a good poem would lodge itself in the mind, that he'd written some poems that couldn't easily be dislodged so the idea that these poems had somehow got into the collective unconscious or the psyche and could not then be dislodged. And what they, the reason they can't be dislodged is that the fears that they anatomize and confront are very primal fears, I think. And that goes back to his childhood again, that this idea of the lyrical, very lyrical wind, the only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake, uh, and these beautiful rhymes that go throughout Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening are like a kind of seductive hymn. They're almost like a kind of death lament, enticing him into the woods. And into, it's like the, the onset of frostbite just before uh, you succumb. It's supposed to be a del delicious experience. The woods are lovely, dark and deep but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. He was very proud of the way he suddenly hit on the idea of repeating the last line as a way of getting out of the poem. Let's say something about a later poem called The Most of It, which I think takes up lots of the themes that we've been talking about and, and does something quite interesting with them. It's a poem that purports to be about the meaninglessness of the universe, doesn't it? I mean, that's how it starts. It's a very in some ways, quite a kind of portentously metaphysical poem as it opens. He thought he kept the universe alone. If you just came across that line on its own, you might think, well, I don't know, it might be Stevens. I'm not quite sure what it is. For all the voice in answer he could wake was but the mocking echo of his own. So this is a very, as I say, a very sort of philosophical or metaphysical predicament that he's placing the protagonist, the anonymous protagonist of his of his poem in, sh shouting at the universe to try and persuade it to give him some meaning. And all the universe does, of course, is echo back his own questions. But then the great coup of this poem is the last few lines, when suddenly a great big buck deer appears out of the countryside, uh, rushes across the water towards him and, and has this, this tremendous sort of visual impact. A great buck, it powerfully appeared, pushing the crumbled water up ahead and landed, pouring like a waterfall and stumbled through the rocks with horny tread and forced the underbrush. And that was all. So how do you interpret that, that last line? Is that, is that a line of, you know, this is plenty, this is more than enough, or, and that's all there was and it amounts to nothing? Well, to use one of Frost's own titles, for once, then, something... <laughs> Normally you don't get anything. <laughs> Here you get something. It's a buck. In for once, then something. It's a kind of glimmer of a white stone, a pebble of quartz, 
which is made much of it in um, Paul Muldoon's great poem, And More Man Has. This is, if you're looking for your romantic counter-response, you're going to get something which will disconcert in Frost. And I think it is connected to the erotic in some ways. The, the, the poem after that, uh, in the same collection, The Subverted Flower, which Lionel Trilling talked about in that famous kind of um, introduction to the Frost reading in the mid-50s, is very much about sort of awkward or inexplicable eroticism uh, and how un unnerving it is. And I think the erotic in Frost is rarely something uplifting or kind of, um, it's something which is overpowering, alien in some ways, which cannot help you really make sense of the world. Uh, this poem, the most of it, was written in the, in the dreadful decade of the 30s um, when Eleanor died and um, he had such, such a long series of losses. And it, it is the most kind of obvious poem to, to put against any kind of romantic vision of a kind of pantheistic nature which would help you make sense of the world. And that though Frost was not an unbeliever, <laughs> he wasn't a believer either. What, what you find in his poetry is this relentless scepticism and an exploration of all the forms that scepticism can take in the context of previous literary or idioms or genres. Um, and th that scepticism is, is, does express great intelligence as well. I think maybe we haven't stressed that enough. What an intelligent poet uh, he is uh, and his rhythms and rhymes, though they may look pat, are often presenting in some mischievous way an undercurrent that pulls against one's longing to believe. In West Running Brook, he creates an idiot, uh, a metaphor for this in terms of the brook, which has a wave which pulls back towards the original source. And that sense of contradiction or, or tension between competing uh, modes of understanding is what gives a given Frost poem its energy. So by the post-war years, as, as you've been saying, the, the figure of Robert Frost has become a public figure. And I suppose the most remarkable uh, instance of his, of his public status is when he is invited to address the nation at Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. Now, I believe the story is that he wrote a poem spe specifically for the occasion, but then the, the sunlight was so bright and his eyes were so old and ailing that he couldn't actually read the poem that he brought along. But he did know by heart his poem, The Gift Outright, and so he recited that um, f from memory. Yes, he, it was a very lame poem in couplets, which <laughs> a long, lame poem in couplets, which no one wanted to hear. So it was very fortunate that he... Um, couldn't read it properly. And The Gift Outright was one of those kind of, you know, one of his greatest hits. And he would often, he would often, at these readings, he would say, say his poems. He often, he didn't read them, he said them. And he would say them twice to say, you know, in case you miss that, <laughs> and he would do it again. Um, and The Gift Outright is again a poem which engages with the sort of standard myths of America and America's specialness and its sense of its own election and uh, its sense of difference from other countries. Maybe it's not quite mocking enough. Uh, it's how do you respond to it? And that first line, the land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. I mean, your first thought has got to be, well, the land wasn't yours, actually. <laughs> there were other people living there. So it, it does rather unthinkingly uh, make use of, of the, the concept of America as a land, unstoried, as it puts it. But it does make from the the, the, the kind of whole experience of uh, the revolution, the constitution, and so on, a sense of them taking possession of the land, which proves is a kind of July the 4th poem in that sense, is an Independence Day poem. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found out that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. A very kind of characteristic Frostian notion that you give in to confusion by giving in, you somehow achieve some kind of sense of belonging or at least a momentary sense of belonging. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war to the land vaguely realising westward. That is a brilliant way of kind of visualising uh, pioneer America of the 19th century, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. <laughs> 
It's a lovely um, ending to the poem. You're right. My only queasiness about it is the line that you read out very beautifully, the deed of gift was many deeds of war, (laughs) which is tucked into parentheses, which, of course, you can't voice over a podcast. But it's an odd thing to tuck into a bracket, isn't it, that the cost of all this was actually violence. It is, but and that, that sort of absolutely goes to Frost's notion that everything good comes out of competition or rivalry. And the reason when he went to visit Khrushchev, <laughs> he was sent by Kennedy to talk with Khrushchev and he wanted to go. Uh, and what he said is, you, you know, you're worthy rivals for us, Khrushchev. You do your thing, we'll do our thing. That's all great. It'll be brilliant. Um, and the notion was winning. Um, isn't the Peter Howarth piece titled Win, Win? And uh, he talks in interviews all the time of how you've got to score. You've got to score. He saw life poetry as a baseball game um and you've got to keep scoring and winning and he hated kind of um the idea of everyone winning prizes only he could win the prizes and he did win the pulitzer prize four times uh the only person to do that of course he kind of you know wined and dined the judges beforehand and it was very kind of uh, we should mention that that he made one terrible mistake in his life and that was choosing as his official biographer lawrence thompson someone who came to viscerally hate frost and who after Frost's death published a three volume 2000 page biography which finds frost describes frost as an appalling person in every single way so he he may have been a good judge of some characters, but he got Lawrence Thompson's character very, very wrong. There have been um, attempts to rewrite Thompson, and Helen Vendler is merciless about a particularly bad one by Jeffrey Myers. But the Jay Perini biography of 2001, I think, or late 1990s, is a pretty sound account, seems to me, of Frost, uh, for better or for worse. And William Pritchard's 1984 biography is also um, a corrective to Lawrence Thompson, perhaps rather the kind. That's the book that Leo Marx is um, reviewing. It forgives him a lot. But I think no account of Frost can, can really do justice to him if it doesn't allow for this really chaotic sense of despair, which kind of lurks around his poems and makes them so powerful. And you get this in... in Poem we briefly mentioned, but perhaps would be a good one to finish with Desert Places, which is uh, kind of resolute in its bleakness, uh, as I think any poem of the 20th century. Why don't you read it, Mark? Because it's, it's, I mean, as you say, it's an extremely bleak poem, but it's a, it's a wonderfully beautiful poem at the same time, I think, and, and is such an interesting countercurrent to the, to the big public figure that Frost had become by, by this stage in his life. This is a poem all about um, being absolutely on your own and tormented by your own kind of interiority. And it it fulfills that um, connection that he makes in an earlier poem between inner weather and outer weather, inner and outer weather. This poem, the landscape, absolutely matches onto his own sense of desolation. Desert places, snow falling, the night falling fast, oh, fast, In a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. The woods around it have it, it is theirs. All animals are smothered in their lairs. I am too absent-spirited to count. The loneliness includes me unawares. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less a blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my own desert places. This episode is from series two of Modern-ish Poets with Mark Ford and Seamus Perry. To listen to their first series and all other close reading series from the London Review of Books, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.